and it sucks! Oh, it sucks in so many ways. Like, just being able to jump up on a ledge directly in front of you, okay? You have to be in just the right position, facing the perfect angle to the wall, one degree left or right, and you just hop up and down in place like a fucking idiot. But that is so small potatoes compared to the floating rocks in the fucking water. These fucking rocks. You come across the first set of rocks about 20 minutes into the game, and I guarantee you, this is where you will smash the keyboard after about 15 minutes of trying to cross this fucking lake and failing about a thousand times. Oh, and you will fail! See, you jump by clicking both mouse buttons at the same time, but there's no way to really target where you're jumping to because you only ever jump straight ahead. And I know that seems obvious, but it can be a real fucking problem in Ultima 8 with its camera angle because if you're even slightly off shit... <laughs> If you're even slightly off center, you fall in the water and die instantly. Not only do you have to angle yourself precisely for every single jump, the isometric perspective here makes it impossible to judge. Ah, damn it! The isometric perspective makes it impossible to judge distance and your angle. There's no way to tell if you're lined up with a distant asshole. Fuck you! What am I doing wrong? He keeps overshooting the fucking cocksucker. Why are the rocks so fucking tiny anyway? Who put these things here? I mean, sometimes you'll be right- Oh, bullshit! Oh, fuck you! Fuck! Oh, what is that? Fuck! Don't you just love it? The Avatar can't swim at all? I mean, at fucking all? The guy's completely helpless the instant he gets in more than ankle deep in the water. Just drowns instantly. Oh, there's a spell that lets you walk on fucking lava, but not one that keeps you safe from the enemy deadlier than grass. A fucking pool. Oh, fuck your ball. Fuck you. I think the actual reason he drowns instantly is because there's a monster in the water at all times, in every part of the water, waiting to drag you under the instant you fall in. I mean, this fucker is everywhere, even this guy's pool in his house which is floating in outer space. Just literally following you around and waiting to devour your ass. One might raise the perfectly logical question why it didn't eat you the moment you dropped in the water at the beginning of the game. And that usually leads to another perfectly logical question. Why am I still playing this piece of fuck? The only way you could have beaten this game back then was to literally save on every single rock after every single jump. And there are dozens of these areas. And get this, later on, the rocks rise and sink. And after that, they move side to side. <sighs> Fuck's sake, I can't believe this. Oh, you have to tippy toe backwards on the rock before you leap forward. God, that's how picky this fucking platforming is. Half a step off an instant death. God, it's about oh. fucking- What? No! 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 so disastrously bad they had to release a patch, but remember, this was before the internet was in common usage. Now a patch is no big deal, but back then this was a huge hassle. The first challenge being even aware there was a patch available in the first place. I don't even remember how I got the patch now. I probably had to dial up a BBS, and I bet half of you don't even know what a BBS is. Later on, patch versions became available on CD, and almost every version you can find now is patched to fix the platforming. Basically what it did was allow you to target jumps on exact locations with your mouse cursor, which makes it easier, I guess, but it's really clear the platforming was intended to be a major focus of the gameplay. They were really proud of this because there's so many of these areas. So the patch makes a significant portion of the game completely pointless busy work. You still want to save before making any jumps though, because even with the patch, the jumping is sometimes off target. Anyway, again, most of the game is spent learning all the different kinds of magic, which works differently on Pagan. But this also has its own share of problems, because even patched, the magic system is glitched like crazy. But let's start with the fact you have to collect and organize reagents for four different schools of magic, which all have their own unique method of preparing spells. As if the inventory wasn't cluttered enough with this tiny little backpack, now you gotta organize thousands of magic ingredients into separate bags, all so you remember where they are, along with all your money, your potions, your weapons, your armor, your spellbooks, your wands, your keys, your scrolls, your gemstones, and your quest items. All in this little fucking backpack. This game can kiss my ass. 
Fucking with the inventory in this little backpack for three straight games really puts my balls in a salad shooter. Would it really have been such a big deal to just have a convenient, easy to read and organize inventory screen? You spend so much wasted time in this game digging through your bag whenever you want to do something for a magic tchotchke. Stacking shit around, pulling one thing out of the stack, putting that in its own bag, waving a magic wand over it again and again and again. Hey, I got an idea. What if we just had our spells arranged in a nice, neat book we could just open and click on the spell we want for quick reference? You know, like Ultima 7? That was easy, right? Here there's no dynamic flow to combat at all. No way to quickly cast spells because you have to have everything prepared way ahead of time. And when you want to cast it, you gotta stop the game, open up your inventory, find the enchanted widget, and double click on it. Not only that, most of the spells are glitched and never run out of charges. So you can cast stuff dozens of times, like having a shield up, making you effectively immortal as you nuke everything around you. Anyway, the first thing you have to do in this game is master necromancy by apprenticing yourself to a dark wizard who raises is the dead to serve him, and you're forced to commit several murders at his command. That is, when he's not forcing you to do his bitch work by collecting wood for him or finding shit in the catacombs. The catacombs, which are, of course, a huge gray maze full of zombies. And you have to do this, I mean, you have to learn the black magic to escape, and you have to do all this evil bullshit! Fuck this, I quit. I'm gonna buy a house here in Pagan. It's not that bad here. I like the mushrooms, it's far away from the water. But hey! What the fuck? These kids are attacking me! What the hell did I do? Get the fuck away from me, you little bastards! Uh, uh. Oh, oh, you want some? Uh, yeah! Oh, you want some too? Uh, yeah! Uh, bash your fucking brains out, yeah! That's what you get, fucking kids. Oh, what? Now, hey, come on, you saw that, right? I didn't start shit. I was just defending myself from those little chill. Hey, now look, I'm the goddamn avatar and I had no other choice, all right? It was like six little bastards coming at me like... I could have been really badly hurt, all right? What was I supposed to do? I'm the good guy. After mastering necromancy, you then have to master wind magic, called theurgy. First they tell you to climb a gray mountain, and then they send you under their gray monastery to mine silver in their gray caves. And for some insane reason, the chamber holding all the silver, which I remind you is necessary for the theurgists to construct their spells, is full of hideously lethal traps, enormous goddamn spiders, and zombies. Once you get the silver, you take it to a blacksmith who turns it into your magic items. And wait, what in the fuck is he doing with his hand? That's disgusting! Sir! I abhor you! Oh my god! After that, you have to see the water titan who lives in, you guessed it, a gray cave. She promises to teach you magic if you release her into the world, which, like a dumbass, you do. Only for her to turn around and screw you by announcing she's gonna destroy the world with storms and hurricanes. Thank you, foolish one, for your actions. Consider my gift of your wretched life as payment for your part. Now I will have my vengeance upon your pathetic kind. I will slay the descendant of my jailer. Let us see who can reach Devon first. Rambling. Um, yeah, oops. And by the way, even though Hydros just directly threatened Devon, she never follows up on it because that plotline was cut since the game was rushed out the door. And finally you learn sorcery, the demonic fire magic taught by the fire titan Pyros. To do this, you first have to summon a demon to have one of the head sorcerer's apprentices violently murdered and torn to pieces. God, I remember when I used to be a good guy. Those were fun times. After that, you have to become the guy's new apprentice and help him summon the frigging devil by chanting around a pentagram. 
During the summoning, you learn that the Master can control Pyros with a magic rock that holds his essence called the Tongue of Flame. So you have to kill the Master now and take it. But unfortunately, the Master lives in a place called the Obsidian Fortress, which you'd think would be black, but instead it's a gray cavern. Again! You also meet Arcadian here, who some of you might remember as the demon inside the Black Sword from previous games, but for some reason- <coughs> PLOT HOLE! <laughs> He doesn't remember you. Oh, holy shit. Look, the master just summoned two demons to stop me. Oh man, I'm screwed. How will I overcome these impossible odds? No man could possibly defeat two demons. Though I guess I'll just run past him in the next room and forget about it. <laughs> well, jeez, that was easy. It's almost like this game wasn't playtested at all. Once you've mastered all the magic on Pagan and you're ready to destroy the Titans, this guy who helps you out named Mithrin gives you a spell to travel back to the ethereal plane to fight them. And he also offers to sell you magic to wreak complete devastation on the entire planet. Yes, he offers to sell you the Armageddon spell for a thousand bucks. What in the hell is wrong with this guy that he's willing to sell you a spell that can destroy all life everywhere, including him? What good is a thousand bucks if nobody's alive to spend it? This makes no sense! So of course I gotta cast it, right? It's like the fucking History Eraser button, some things you just gotta do. So it's Armageddon time, we cast the spell, and it's... completely lame. Jeez. For an apocalypse, that was pretty weak, right? Went to all that trouble and that was the best they could do? Fuck. Oh my god, the ethereal plane isn't a fucking gray cave? Holy shit! I'm seeing a color other than gray! Oh my god, I'm so happy- Oh fuck! Even in outer space, everything's a fucking gray cave! Why? <laughs> It's just all so boring! It's just more jumping around on rocks and to- FUCK! You jump around until you find the Titan, and after all that work, after playing the whole game that's been building up to these cataclysmic fights with the evil gods of Pagan, you finally confront them in their home domain and... you click a magic rock on them from your inventory and kill them without any resistance whatsoever. I'm not even kidding. You just go from one cave to another, Find the Titan- BULLSHIT! THAT WAS BULLSHIT! THAT WAS IMPOSSIBLE! What should be an awesome series of boss fights is easily one of the biggest letdowns in gaming history. You're just clicking an item on each one and they die instantly without a fight. This is not possible! It's even less satisfying than the boss fights in the Zelda CDI games. You know, at least there, you kinda have to maneuver and dodge shit and actually hit the guy. You're not just clicking on the bad guy. This sucks. Once you've clicked the four titans to death, you absorb their power and become the Titan of Aether. You're literally a god now, and you open a black gate of your own to leave Pagan at last. You step through into a white misty area, and I'm really not sure what this place is supposed to be, but it's cool. Then you appear in a red hellish waste, with blasted skies and devastated lands all around, and towering above you is an enormous monument to the Guardian. You're too late. Britannia has fallen. <laughs> you know, it's funny, because uh, when you play Ultima 9, Britannia never actually looks like that. And in fact, the uh, the intro for this game directly contradicts everything you just saw in this ending, because uh, you don't even go back to Britannia like it just showed. And really, uh, this game contradicts every single thing that happened in Ultima 8, and every single Ultima game, like, ever. <sighs> All right. I have to explain something to you about this game here. Ultimate 9 is the whole reason I started this retrospective, because, you know, I realized that I couldn't review 9 without reviewing every single game that came before it, because you really had to take this ride from the beginning to really understand the heights from which this series fell down to this point. I mean, you really had to see everything to really comprehend what a god-awful piece of shit this game really is, because I tell you this now, with no hyperbole, with complete fucking honesty, Ultima 9 is, without a doubt in my mind, the biggest betrayal <laughs> Oh, bad move coming back for seconds, motherfucker. This time I'm ready. Yeah! This could take a while, folks. I'll see you next time for Ultima 9!
Ja! 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 Ja!